Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Sheldon F- Alcoholic. Hey, it's nice to be here. It's uh, good to have... Uh, uh, dinner at, uh, with Jerry tonight and uh, the place that he works at and uh, I was surprised to find that everybody kind of likes him there it was kind of you know I, I mean I don't know if you guys know him the way that I know him it's shocking to find that people actually like him so that was really very cool <laughs> very very nice Be- very 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 gracious host and uh, it's been a pleasure being out here so I tell you a little bit a little bit about me um, I'm an alcoholic uh, you know, I was telling Jerry this, uh, this story at dinner. I, when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, I kind of came here by default. I kind of showed up at AA. I knew I had a problem. I was drinking out of control. Every time I drink, I get in trouble. I, I get, I, I drink away my rent money. I drink away jobs. I drink away friends. I drink away family members. But I also, uh, uh, do some of that stuff in AA that we're not supposed to talk about. No, it's kind of a funny thing. I heard a guy say from the podium, and I, I don't really like to quote stuff that I hear other guys say from the podium, but this was so beautiful, I, I, I think it deems repeating. He said that if we come to Alcoholics Anonymous sometimes and we say, you know, I drank so much, and when I was drinking sometimes, I was abusive to my kids, and we go, yeah, I know, that's true, I agree with that too. When I was drinking sometimes, you know, I would, I would, I would, I would cheat on my wife, or, oh, yeah, you know, I and that you know, sometimes when I was drinking, I would steal from my boss. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes when I was drinking, I did drugs, and we say, "Get out!" You know, <laughs> you, you know, we don't have that behavior here for crying out loud. But, uh, but, but, but I was very confused when I got here because I drank an awful lot. I'm really an alcoholic. It's the only disease I have. I have alcoholism, and I have a resume that that that, that backs that up. But I also did a lot of drugs, and I could have, I think at the time, I think I could have gone to any 12-step program, and I think I could have qualified. And I would have, if you would have asked me, I would have told you, if you put on a scale uh, the alcohol on one side and the drugs on the other, I would have told you that the drugs would have tipped higher. But I really don't have any true perception of what my life is really like. I had a conversation with a guy that I used to work for many years ago. He found me through a strange set of circumstances, and he called me up. And I said, he says to me, is this Sheldon? I can handle my liquor fetty. Right? <laughs> and I was shocked. I said, what are you talking about? I mean, I know I drank a little, but I was doing all that other stuff way more surely. And he said, I don't know anything about that. I didn't see that. I don't know anything about that. I just saw a guy that drank a lot. I ran into another guy in Philadelphia a few months ago, and uh, his job, I had a, a, a public speaking job for a company where I had to show up and, 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 and essentially perform for them. And his job was to make sure that I showed up and that my shirt was tucked in and that I wasn't slurring my words too bad before they put me out on the stage to give the presentation. And we were talking about those days, and he told me that the over and under on me was very short. He said his job was to keep me alive long enough for the product that we were selling to run its calls. And I said, yeah, man, I was a bad drug addict. And you know what he said? I don't know anything about that. I just saw you drink uncontrollably like a fish. And if you were doing that other stuff, I didn't see any of it. And it's funny how my perception is of those kind of things. My memories of my drinking career, my memories of what I used to do it. Are, are, are blurry and hazy, but it starts before that. You know, it's funny, and we'll talk about this a little bit later about how my perception of my recollection is of things. But when I think about my childhood, I don't remember much about my childhood other than me. <laughs> you know, I mean, there were people that I went to school with, and sometimes I can kind of remember their faces, but I don't really remember their names. I'll bump into people. I left the town that I grew up in uh, was in England. And so I, it's not like I grew, you know, I became an adult and 
and have had contact with these people for years afterwards. But I bump into people. I go back to England to visit family, and I bump into people, and they know exactly who I am and have these conscious memories of me. And to me, they're like, who are you? What's your name? Did I know you? So I have this strange perception of my life, and uh, I'm telling you that up front because what I'm going to tell you about my life is my best recollection of it. <laughs> Doesn't necessarily mean it's 100% accurate, but it is my best recollection of it. I do remember my first drink, and, uh, and, and that is, is, is interesting at best. I don't think it makes me an alcoholic, but I do remember it. I, uh, alcohol is not the only thing in my life that I've loved. My very favorite candy in the world always used to be Snickers bars. I love Snickers bars. I don't remember my first one. Right? <laughs> Stands to reason there was Snicker number one, doesn't it? Right? But I don't, I don't remember it, but I do remember my first drink. I was nine years old. I was the kid called Barry. Barry was 11. Because he was two years older than me, that meant he was cool. And I wanted to hang out with Barry. And I would have done just about anything Barry wanted to do. And in hindsight... I'm kind of glad what Barry wanted to do was drink, because who knows what direction my life could have taken, right? But Barry wanted to drink, and we stood in front of a liquor store in the little city in the north of England, and we waited for someone that was willing to go in and buy us some booze. And we found a guy that was going to buy us some booze. He bought us a bottle of Old English apple cider, right? Apple juice with a kit. We went in a wooded area behind the liquor store, and we drank the, the Old English apple cider. Barry took a big swig on the bottle, passed me the bottle. I'd watched what he did. He took a big swig. I took a big swing. What happened next was going to happen almost every time I drank from that day forward. I puked out of my nose. Because I'm a nose puker. <laughs> I mean, I just, I'm not very good at drinking. You know, I'm not. Some of you guys, right, some of you guys will, will say, and you'll be telling the truth, that you could drink everybody under the table. And when you got under the table, I was already there. Right. Oh, welcome to Under the Table. I've been here for a while. <laughs> it's just that's just my, my deal. I'm not a mass quantity drinker kind of guy. Uh, some of you guys will say that you, you play guitar better when you drink and you, you, you dance better and you can talk to people of the opposite sex better. And uh, God forbid you can drive better when you drink. I'm, I'm, I'm not that guy. I'm the guy that pees on the couch and hits on your mom. That's the kind of <laughs> that's the kind of drunk that I am. I'm not I'm not very if quant, large quantities of alcohol or what make you an alcoholic. I don't qualify under that account. I'm, I'm, but I love it. I love what it does to me. I love how it makes me feel. I'm an awkward kid. I remember being uh, uh, a kid growing up, and and I'm the one. And many of us probably have this fantasy. I'm not unique in this, but I'm I'm like convinced that I must have been adopted, right? I don't feel like I fit in the family. One of the reasons I hated my brother is because we looked alike. And he said he remembered me being born, you know? And it's like, I don't think that's true. I think I, I don't think I I don't think I'm from this family. I don't fit with any of you people. I'm awkward and I'm insecure and I'm not. Boy, I don't even really know there's something wrong with me, but I just don't think life is fun. You know, I remember the first spiritual idea that I ever learned, and I don't even know where I learned it, and I don't know if what I learned is what they taught me, but it seemed like someone told me that life was a test that we have to endure, and at the end of the test, we're rated on how we do, and then God gives us our blessings or our rewards, and I didn't know much about that, but it sure did feel like life was a test. It sure did feel like I was failing the test. And I'm nine years old, and Barry gives me this drink of old English apple cider. And at that moment in my life, I'm short, I'm fat, I feel like I'm, 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 I got a big nose, I'm born into a Jewish family, I don't fit in. My mom and dad have been divorced since I was two years old. I feel like my life is just a disaster. And I take this drink of old English apple cider, and nothing really happened. But it felt emotionally like all my problems were solved. It felt emotionally like I could fit in the world. It was almost as if, it was almost as if my parents got remarried. Like I grew three inches, like I lost 20 pounds, like I got a nose job, like my foreskin grew back, you know? I mean, it was. <laughs> I just want to make sure you're listening because I might get to some good stuff later. But that wasn't it, but I might get to some later. So I'll make sure you pay attention. <laughs> but, it, but really, what it felt like was it felt like, oh, I could breathe finally. 
I love when I felt I'm nine years old, I make a decision I'm going to drink whenever I can for the rest of my life as much as I can. And of course, when you're nine and you live with my mom and, and in that household, I didn't drink every day. I drank whenever I could, but that was probably a couple more times that year, a couple, three times, you know, when I was 12 or whatever. By the time I'm 13 years old, uh, uh, the, 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 the ritual in the Jewish faith at 13, uh, it's the funniest thing in the world, you become a man. Right, and so I have my bar mitzvah, and my grandfather says at the party afterwards, "Well, you're a man now; you can watch the bar." And he has no idea, but he lets me watch the bar. He goes off to get something to eat, and there's, you know, I mean, it's amazing for a 13 year old kid. There's clear stuff, yellow stuff, brown stuff. You know, there's some green stuff. I mean, it's just, and you're, we're drinking the rainbow. And uh, by the time that night was over, uh, I. I Slapped my mom across the face. It's the only time I ever raised my hands to my mom on the night that I became a man. And I was passed out on the couch. And my grandfather thought it would be funny to place an empty bottle of scotch by my head. So whereas most kids at 13 years old have a beautiful photograph on their bar mitzvah day, dressed in all the religious garb, stood next to something pretty, I'm passed out on the couch with my shirt untucked, tie sprayed, and a and a and a bo- empty bottle of booze next to my head. And, my mom and uh, my grandfather, anyway, thought that was a funny picture. Had he known that was the way I was going to look for the next 15 years, he may not have seen the humor in it quite as much. But uh, 15, 16 years old, I'm finding a way to drink something uh, every day. And I loved it. I got to tell you, I love drinking. You know, sometimes you hear people in AA, I heard a guy say, and, and uh, it's a misquote out of the big book. Uh, and, and But I understood why he said it, but it wasn't my experience. He said that his best day drinking was not as good as his worst day in AA. And I'm thinking, what were you drinking? Because I had some good times drinking. You know what I mean? I mean, I love drinking. I remember one time, sometimes I remember things in pictures, and I remember one time in like 92 or 93, I'm at Shoreline Amphitheater, just outside of San, uh, San Jose, California, in the Grateful Dead are playing. And it's a real steep amphitheater, and I'm in the cheap seats at the way back. And the band are at the bottom and, and, and on the stage, and it's foggy and misty and damp, but it's not raining. And Jerry starts to sing, It Looks Like Rain. And I'm on four heads of window pane, and I had a spiritual experience, <laughs> right, the likes of which no 12 step call has ever provided for me, you know, and it was magical. And if it still felt that way, I'd still be doing it. You know what I mean? 21, 22 years old, my career starts to take off. Uh, I was actually a fairground pitchman for many years. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Some of you have been to the fair. I did that for a little while, and through that job, I got a job doing infomercials and, and uh, QVC and all that kind of stuff. And at 22 years old, I was the youngest national spokesperson for Kenwood Appliances, and it was a great gig. And that was the job that the guy had to make sure I was dressed before I went on live television. That was his job. He was my handler. And uh, they fired me from that job. Now, they told me they fired me because they didn't want an alcoholic reprobate as their national spokesperson, which I thought was a little irrational and unfair. I was sure that <laughs> they, they, you know, they, they, they I, Figured it was really because they didn't like Jews, is what I realized. <laughs> I, got a, I got an excuse for everything, right? I, I lose that job and I get another job. I'm 24 years old and I'm the vice president of marketing for an integrated circuit house, and they fired me from that job. And they fired me from that job for an entirely different reason. The owner of that company pulled me and said, You're doing a great work. You're doing a good job. Your numbers are fine. However, you can't show up to work drunk. Uh, you're doing a good job drunk. And if you worked by yourself at home, I wouldn't mind. But the other employees are getting the opinion that it's okay for them to come back from lunch drunk, and they're not doing as good a job as you. You can't drink at work. You just can't. I don't care what you do on your own time. Can't drink at work. Don't drink at work. So I decide I'm not going to drink at work, so I don't drink at work. And what happens is something happens inside of me when I'm not drinking, right? I get this. The book says restless, irritable, and discontent. And what I really get is I just get locked up. I just get uptight. Things just bother me. I just get frustrated, and I can't really put my finger on what's wrong with me. And if you ask me how I'm doing, I'm going to tell you I'm doing fine, but I'm not really doing very fine. You know what I mean? I'm just kind of, 
And so when I got fired from that job, I didn't get fired from that job for drinking. I got fired from that job because I would make the secretaries cry. And I'm not really a secretaries cry kind of guy. I'm more a life of the party, let's tell a few jokes and have a laugh kind of guy. But in a state of abstinence, locked up in between drinks, I'm no fun to be around. I'm the guy that you walk around on eggshells because you never know how I'm going to react. And I'm at work and I can't wait till that five o'clock bell rings and we get up for work. And I can go out and get drunk and whoo, breathe again and breathe again. I get fired from that job. 27 years old, 26 years old. Uh, I've come from hero to zero. I've come from, from uh, you know, I'm the kid with all the potential. You know, I'm the kid that's going to go somewhere. But I've burned every opportunity and I've trashed every opportunity. And I've spilt my potential on barroom floors and back alleyways and now I can barely hold a job, and I enter back into a business I've been in periodically. I go back in the car business, but I can't hold a job. I'm three, four weeks on the job, and either they fire me or I walk off, or I just don't show up. I mean, who knows how much money I left at jobs because I never went back for that last paycheck, you know. I, probably, I, could, I could probably live a month on just, you know, the last paychecks at minimum wage rates from when I was a kid from walking off the job and never going back for that last check. I'm uh, standing at a friend's house, and I, I, I steal from him. I didn't mean to, um, but but I just, he, there was an, I'm an, if someone used the word, up, I'm not a thief, I'm an opportunist, <laughs> and I love that word because it kind of fits with what I am, you know, I back me in a corner, get me in a spot where I need to make a move to get something to get me how I need to be, so I, I stole from the last guy that let me stay at his house, and uh, I end up in my dad's driveway, and I'll, maybe I'll get to talk about my dad a little bit, but at this point in my dad and I's relationship, I'm not allowed in the house. Uh, his wife, uh, my stepmom of 20-some years at the time, wouldn't let me in the house anymore because I knew she hated me, and it was unreasonable of her, but she, she didn't want me in the house anymore. The truth is, is that every time I left, my dad would sit and cry at the disgusting shape that his baby boy was in and his fear of what my life was starting to look like. And so it broke his heart, and she didn't want to see him get a broken heart. So we would sneak seeing each other in the driveway of the house. And, and the way that that would occur is that basically I would call and say, Dad, I need some money. And he'd say, meet me in the driveway. And he'd give me money, and I'd leave. And uh, uh, i go to his house, that day, I need help. And he puts me in a hotel for the night. I go to the hotel bar and his credit card, and I know that when that bill comes in, it's one more time that I put him in a bad spot financially. One more time, I put him in a bad spot with his wife. One more time, I've let him down. And I, st I start crying in his hotel room, and I called uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, and I went to a meeting with a guy, and then I went to a detox with a guy, with that same guy, and I spent seven days in detox, and uh, I went from the detox to a, a halfway house, and, and I learned something that I was going to use as a valuable tool for the next few years, and that is that if I told my dad I was in AA, he'd forgive me again and give me money. If I called my boss and said, I'm in detox, he'd forgive me and let me keep my job. And so I didn't get to stay sober that time, but I got to learn that AA will provide for me some pretty valuable stuff if I want to ask for it, and it used to provide for me the ability to get the heat off my back. Some of us have been to court, and the judge says, if you go to A, we bring back the court cards. The judge lightens our sentence. And so we get to use AA. If we don't want to get sober, it'll provide us with some beautiful things, and AA provided me with that. But I'm in this halfway house, and I'm 30 days in this halfway house. And when I first got there, I couldn't believe how amazing this place was. The guy that owned the house let you stay there rent-free for a month, which was good. For a week, which was good. I had no money. And at the end of that week, if you were looking for a job and he saw you actively looking for a job, he'd let you stay for another week. And at the end of that second week, if you had a job, he wasn't keeping tabs. It was free rent. He'd let you stay for two more weeks until you got your first checks. You could have a whole month free in this house. It was beautiful as long as you were looking for a job. They provided food. It was, I mean, breakfast and dinner, and you could take sandwiches for lunch. AA members would bring in cigarettes. Back then, you could smoke in these kind of places. They, they, they'd lay cigarettes on the, on the coffee tables. I mean, it was beautiful. They laundry facilities. It was beautiful. But 30 days in, I got this I'm not drinking thing going on. And I got 
the uncomfortability, and I'm just a little, I'm not, you know what, you can't describe it to a non-alcoholic, right? They say it's like trying to teach a pig how to sing, right? It wastes your time and annoys the pig. But if you if you got that thing that I got, and you know what it's like when your emotions start to tighten, and you start to see the color bleaking out of the world, and things start to get boring at best, and you're just kind of on edge, and you don't really know why everything's getting, but oh, I'm just getting that way, and I'm just not drinking, because I'm just not drinking. But after 30 days of feeling like that, I start to realize that these people have a nerve. You know what they wanted me to do? A chore. They wanted me to make my bed. You got a lot, you lost your mind. My mother couldn't get me to make my bed when I was nine years old. Who do you think you are? Telling me what time to come home. A curfew. What are you, nuts? I'm over 18. And I left that out. And what started for me next was the worst two years of my life. Because what started for me next was I started to drink to get sober, to drink to get sober, to get sober, to drink to get sober. I spent a couple, about three years all together, uh, uh, getting sober and then getting drunk and then getting loaded and then getting sober and then getting drunk. I would get an average of about... 10 days. I got 60 days uh, a couple of times, 30 days a couple of times, lied about 60 days a couple of times. Uh, but on av- sometimes I'd leave the meeting and get drunk. Sometimes i get one, two days. Sometimes I'd get no days. But I figure that over the time, I probably got about 10 days on average. <clears throat> and after about 10 days, what would happen to me would be bizarre because Maybe early on when I first went to that halfway house, I didn't really want to get sober. But a couple of three years in of getting drunk to get sober, to get drunk to get sober, to get drunk to get sober, you start to want your life to change. My life started to become unacceptable to me. I started to think that I was a real piece of garbage. I started to think that there was no hope for me. I started to imagine that obviously what was going to happen was that I was going to continue this cycle of getting drunk to get sober, to get drunk, to get sober, to get drunk, to get sober. And I didn't imagine myself dying in the next few years. I imagined myself to one of those guys that lingers. I was 28 years old when I got sober. I was 26 years old in the middle of this experience. And I could see myself being at least 50 something. 60-something, 30 or 40 more years of this, and I'm starting to get suicidal. I'm filled with guilt, shame, remorse, uncomfortability. I see no path for a future that makes any sense to me, and it's bleak. And on top of everything else I think about myself, I can't even kill myself. I don't have the nerve to slam the steering wheel and drive the car into the abutment on the freeway. I don't have what it takes to put a gun in my mouth and squeeze the trigger, because on top of everything else, I'm like Wilson, who swayed in front of the medicine cabinet, cursed himself as a coward because he can't take the poison. I'm that guy. You know, people say that suicide is the coward's way out. You know who says that? People who've never been suicidal. Because those of us that wish they could die and don't have the nerve to do it knows what it feels like to, on top of all the other self-loathing, to know that you don't even have what it takes to do the right and kind thing to the people that your life is destroying and to yourself. 10 days, and I'm restless, irritable, and discontent. I'm frustrated, and I'm irritated, and I can't imagine. I'm right out of the book. 13 years old, nine years old, in the back of that wooded area with my friend Barry. I couldn't imagine life without alcohol. 25, 26, 27, 28 years old, in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, getting sober to get loaded. I can't imagine life with or without alcohol. I was at the end, and I would wish for the jumping off point. And I don't know what to do. And I don't know what to do. And if you figure three years, 365 days in a year, every 10 days, 36 times a year, it's about 100 times plus coming into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. One more time is a failure. One more time not knowing how to stay sober. One more time. And I, I don't... If you're new and you're struggling like I struggled, I'm going to tell you something really honest. July 17th of 1996 is when I walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous for the last time. That's my sobriety day. And I don't know what was different that day than the hundred times before that I walked in. I don't know. I'm going to try my best to describe it, but I don't know for sure. So if you're new and you're like me and you've been struggling to go in and go out and go in and go out, my experience was that at least I never left AA. I kept showing up 
even though I was getting drunk. And if you're new and you're struggling and you're doing what I was doing and you're doing that dance, keep dancing. Just keep dancing. But on July 17th of 1996, I walked into a place called the Kiss Club. And the club's not even there anymore, and it was no special day for me. It's not like something more horrible had happened than any other time. There was no event that caused me to get... It was just another time where I showed up at the end of my rope, just, I'm going to quit. I sat down in that group, and if you'd have asked me, if you'd have said, Sheldon, are you done? I'd have said, in fact, I'd have said no, but if I was honest, I'd have said probably not. Are you going to drink again? Probably. Why do you say that? Because I always do. It's just what I do. What I do is I drink again. That's what I do. So I'm going to drink again. When? I don't know when. I don't know when, but I'm going to. I mean, look at my track record. Why? I don't know. I don't know why. I just am. I do it again. That's what I do. I do it again. I always do it again, and I'll do it again this time. I do it again. There's a faction of Alcoholics Anonymous that you see in some towns and some meetings. They're the big book carrying, step working, sponsor, having, service, doing. You know the ones. They're always happy to see you when you're new. <laughs> Hi! Welcome to the... I wore out everybody else. I wore out the cribbage players and the barbecue doers. I wore them out. You know, they, I think I scare them because they're able to not do much and stay sober, and I'm not able to not do nothing and stay sober, and I think I scare them. So they start brushing me off. Oh, it's him again. You know? Those big book guys, they just kept coming at me. Let's go to a meeting. Who's your sponsor? Are you in this, do you work in this, do you have a home group? Well, I didn't believe what they said would work for me. I didn't. But I had nobody else to hang out with. I had nowhere else to go. There was no other group that would take me. They were the only ones that were saying, get in the car. So I got in the car. And if I'm going to get in the car and I'm going to hang out with them, i got to have difficult answers to difficult questions. Like, who's your sponsor? Well, you got to get one, don't you, so you can answer them so they'll leave you alone. You know? <laughs> what step are you on? I suppose you should be on a step. You know, you tell them step one for too long, they laugh at you. You know, I mean, come on. How could you be on step one? We've been watching you, kid. Who's your home group? Uh, it's the six o'clock meeting at the clubhouse. No, 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 no. Not what meeting do you go to? What's your home group? Where do you have a job and a commitment? Where are you involved? Who are the people you're creating a fellowship with? You got to have answers for those questions. So I started to do what they were doing, not because I imagined it would work. I started to do what they were doing because if you're going to hang around with those people, you got to do what they're doing, even though you don't want to do what they're doing. And if there was anyone else I could have hung around with, I'd have hung around with somebody else. But those were the people that were saying, get in the car. And I got swept along. I just got picked up and swept along. I got a sponsor. This guy shared at a meeting, and he, it was a noon meeting, and he started to share about things that they were said before. But I never heard him. I don't know why I never heard him, but I never heard him. He started to talk about being lonely, feeling like you don't fit in your own family, feeling like the world has got some kind of a weird thing that's against me, the color running out of the universe. He started to feel about the bleakness of his existence and drinking to try and escape that. And the only thing that he had ever had that let him escape that was making it worse. Like the only escape route was into the fire. Oh my God. That's where I'm at. So I asked him for help. And he told me he was my sponsor. I'm so glad he didn't make me ask that question. Will you sponsor me? Because it's like asking a girl to dance at the prom. And I'm a wallflower at the prom. You know, I can't, I can't ask that question. I mean, I know she's going to say no, you know, for crying out loud. So I'm glad he didn't say, he said, do you have a sponsor? I said, no. He said, would you like me to sponsor you? I said, oh, God, please. Yes. He's been my sponsor for, for a little over 18 years. We started a journey through the steps. 
Step one was not that complicated for me. Step one was, I mean, when you live my life and you've been in the trouble I've been in and you've had the existence I've had, the fact that I am powerless over alcohol is obvious even to an idiot like me. We just had to have like this formal conversation where I admitted some of the madness of my life. Now, the fact that my life was unmanageable was a little bit more difficult for me to swallow because I was the guy when I wasn't drinking that had had great success at a very early age. And I knew if I could just quit drinking, I would have that success again. And you and I know, because we've been in Alcoholics Anonymous for a while, that the fact that my life was unmanageable while I was drinking doesn't change when I get sober. But I'm glad he didn't really harp on that too much because I didn't have a sober experience of an unmanageable life. So how could I possibly have identified with it? That came over the months and years that followed. What he said to me is, well, well, let's talk about your unmanageable life. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you told me for the last three years you've been getting drunk after you promised yourself you'd get sober. About every 10 days, and it's about 100 times. So 100 times you've made the executive manager decision that you're not going to drink anymore. And about a hundred times, with all the evidence against the fact that drinking's a good idea, you've somehow changed your mind that drinking would be a good idea. That doesn't sound very manageable to me. Why don't we see if we can find another way to manage your life? Fine. Fine. We got to step two. And I can't do step two. I just can't do step two. I'm sorry, I can't do step two. Why can't you do step two? I don't believe in God. Pretty easy. Can't do step two. Why don't you believe in God? Very simple. Grew up in a Jewish home. It's not true. I grew up in an atheist Jewish home. Right? Now what that means is that we're Jews, but we know we're wrong. Right? That's what that means. So in other words, what we do is, is we do all the rituals of the faith, and we, there's nobody talking about God and spiritual connectedness. There's no sense of belonging. There's no attachment to anything spiritual. We're just doing the rituals of the faith. My mom would say, she'd say, honey, religion is just the opiate of the masses. It's all just a big fairy tale. Now put your shirt on, we're going to temple. In the Jewish faith, in the uh, uh, sect that we were in, you're not supposed to drive on Saturday. Not supposed to drive on Saturday. Got to walk to Temple. Temple's five miles away from from uh, from our house. There were people that would walk five miles to Temple. We're not five mile Jews. <laughs> <laughs> we would drive to about a quarter mile away, park around the corner, and we'd walk the last because we're quarter mile Jews. That's the kind of Jews we are. We're we're point two fivers. That's what we are. You know. And in my school, there was a religious leader, a chazan, a cantor, who, who had gotten in trouble for messing with little boys and girls in the choir. And that adds to my certainty that the religious folk are stupid. Um, uh, I'll, I'll talk about my childhood perhaps in a little bit here if we get time, but we'd moved from a, a, a nice neighborhood to a Section 8 housing neighborhood. We became a welfare family and and we didn't fit in in the, in the non-Jewish neighborhood. We'd get in fights a lot. I'd get beaten up for my faith. And then the Jewish kids would look down on us because being a divorced family in 1972 in a small religious community wasn't as cool or hip as it is today. And there was problems from that. And just the whole thing. My mom used to clean the houses of the people. I mean, just the whole thing was just... So the Jewish faith was like a walls built up. Can't do the Jewish faith. Can't, can't do that can't do the Christian faith either. It's not possible for me. Could you imagine if all of a sudden you were to get sober in a place where they said, and if you're a Christian, if they said, in order to get sober, you're going to have to become a Muslim? I mean, it's like that. It's what you're raised with. You're ingrained. There is no change in that. You're wired that way. Can't do a Christian faith. And I think that's what you want me to do. I Because, you know, when it's 1996 and in Las Vegas, and they say, God, does he may express himself in our group conscience. I know who you mean. Right? And you think my ancestors killed him, right? Which is like bizarre. I can't, I can't play that. I can't, I can't do it. I just can't do it. Can't do my God. Can't do your God. Don't believe in God. My sponsor says, what's that got to do with step two? I said, what do you mean? 
came to believe in the power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. And I'm crazy. And I got to come to believe in the power greater than myself. I don't believe in nothing. It's, well, let's look at what the book says. Because the book's different than the wall. We got to look at the book. The book says, do I now believe? No, I do not. I know you don't, Shelton. Calm down. <laughs> do, you're so quick to argue. I am. I know. I know with, even with myself, right? <laughs> right? I mean, I, I'm arguing with you in my mind right now, and you haven't even said anything, for God's sakes, right? He says, he says, he says, and you're arguing back. I know you are. He says, he says, he says, he says, he says to me, he says, do I now believe? No, I don't. I know you don't. But I'm even willing to believe in a power greater than myself. What does that mean? Am I even willing to believe? Here's good grammar. Am I even willing to believe that maybe, just maybe, perhaps there might be a God? Maybe. Probably not. <laughs> I mean, I doubt it. I don't believe. I'm telling you right now, I don't believe. But maybe, I suppose, there might be. I mean, I'm willing. A little bit. A touch. Maybe. Perhaps. No. Yes. No. Yeah, maybe. Okay. <laughs> as long as I don't have to believe. No, you don't have to believe. No, you do not have. But are you willing to believe that God might exist? Okay. I mean, even a guy like me can walk through that, right? It's that broad room. Even a guy, the book says as soon as a man can say he does believe, which let me remind you, I didn't. No way. Uh uh. <laughs> or he's even willing to believe, which I suppose I am, that there's a power greater than himself. We emphatically ensure him he's on his way. That means done. Step two. It's over with. Move on. You're finished. It's over. <laughs> Stop being stuck on step two. It's just an excuse not to do step four. We know that. Right? We know that. So stop it. Right? Are you willing that maybe perhaps? I suppose. But I can't do step three. Why? Can't do it. Can't turn my will and my life over to something I don't believe in. I mean, that would be hypocritical. To which my sponsor says, you've been a hypocrite all your life. <laughs> what's, what's the difference one more time? Right? As, if, as if I have great honor. Right? <laughs> but seriously, he says, well, you know, let's do this. Let's ask some of the guys in the home group, the guys you respect, the guys you like, the guys that you uh, uh, feel like have the kind of life you'd like. Let's ask them why they're sober. Okay. Well, you ask them, and it's almost like it's like, like on a cue card. Everybody says the same thing. I'm sober today because of a power greater than myself <laughs> that I've found in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd like to thank God for AA, and I'd like to thank AA for God. Right? <laughs> now, I don't mean to goof on that, because after the meeting, if you ask me why I'm sober, I'm going to tell you I'm sober today because of a power greater than myself that I found in the rooms of AA. And, and... When I die, and I don't know what happens when you die, but if you get to ask God or talk to God or say anything to God, I'm going to say, by the way, Pops, that AA thing, good deal. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks much. Right? Grateful. Got me to you. Got me sober. You're the man. I mean, I believe that that's true. So I go back to my sponsor and I say that to him. He says, well, you know why. He says, okay. So if you're sober because of God, and that's why you're sober, and you find God in step two or step three, why the hell would you do step four? Really? It sucks. Step four sucks. Nobody wants to do it. It sucks. So why the hell would you do it if you found God in step three? Hmm. Huh. Why would you do step five? That's embarrassing. Six and seven, nobody understands. Right? <laughs> Eight and nine, expensive. Ten and a <laughs> right? I mean, seriously, right? I mean, if you find God in three, why the hell would you do anything else? Ten and eleven, half of us don't know which one's ten and which one's eleven, <laughs> right? We're very confused about those two steps. Twelve, now, not in Atlanta, but in Vegas. New people smell. Why would you want to talk to them, right? Not interested. Not interested. Not going to do any of it. Find God in step three. One, two, three, drink. One, two, three, drink. Step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. It's the result. It's why you do them. Do the steps, get the spiritual experience as a result of the steps. Can't get the kind of spiritual experience we talk about in Alcoholics Anonymous as a result of 12 steps you haven't taken. Huh. That makes sense to me. And he starts to talk about something that uh, um, uh, comes out of AA history. And he started to talk about Alcoholics Anonymous as a pragmatic, scientific method to spirituality. And this makes sense to me. 
that in Alcoholics Anonymous, we come in and we say, okay, I don't really believe in God. You say God's the answer. Okay, I'm not really sure. So I'm going to set up a scientific experiment. In that scientific experiment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what a scientist would do. If a scientist thinks something's true but isn't sure, he sets up an experiment. The results of the experiment will prove it's true. And then if the experiment turns out to be positive, it's proved. If it turns out to be negative, it's proved in the negative. It's proved the other way around. But the scientist doesn't go into the experiment having a preconceived idea of what the answer is going to be. He's just testing a theory. So in step three, he says, we're going to test a theory. We're going to start to act as if God exists. And a few weeks or months or years from now, whatever, we'll have a conversation about how your life looks and whether or not you acting as if God exists has done benefit to your life. And the first thing that we're going to do to do that is we're going to get rid of the things that have been blocking. The things that have been making you, the things that when you go to sleep at night and you close your eyes that make you crazy and keep you awake. The pathetic, petty, little resentments, the angers, the fear, the sexual behavior that you're embarrassed of. We're just going to make a list of all those things. We're just going to take a look at them and see if we can remove a blockage from you and God. And when I did my fourth step, the first name on my list was my dad. My dad left when I was two years old. I hated my dad. Hated my dad. He left when I was two. I hated him. Guy's no good. Loser. Hate him. Hate him. Second name on the list was my mom. My mom was angry and she'd yell and scream a lot. It was very difficult being in the house with her. And it just, it wasn't fun growing up with her. And then my list after that was, you know, we could write these. If you're new and you haven't done this, mom, dad. siblings (laughs) siblings <laughs> right current boss current girlfriend or a boyfriend right wife or spouse or whatever previous boss previous spouse and just trickles down to anyone that had any meaningless little influence in your life whatsoever right? i had the lunch lady from when i was five years old on my fist I, it's ridiculous i was 28 years old the woman who 23 years <laughs> earlier had gone I hated him. I hated him with good reason. I still don't like him very much today, to be honest. Lunch ladies. Anyway, right? So, so I write this down. I go to my sponsor. My dad's number one, and we start talking about my dad. And uh, there's a great line in the book. It says, this was our cause. We realized the people who offended us were perhaps spiritually sick, that we didn't like their symptoms or the way they disturbed us. They were like ourselves. My sponsor says, how are you like your dad? I mean, obviously, dad left. I hate my dad. My dad left. It affected everything. Self-esteem, personal relationships, security, uh, ambition, pride. Everything's affected, right? Everything's affected. How are you like your dad? I'm not like my dad. I hate my dad. My dad's an ugly son of a bitch. He starts off with, well, maybe your dad did the best he could for you with the tools. Get new tools, right? I was two years old when he left, and we went from a nice middle-class house in the middle of a Jewish neighborhood to welfare housing in an anti-Semitic neighborhood. I hate my dad. I got no time for him. So let's move on. We went to my mom. What'd your mom do? Oh, screamed and yelled a lot. Didn't feel much love. Never sure how she was going to react when I walked in the house. What's affected everything? Self-esteem, personal relations, uh, pocketbook, pride, emotional security, self-esteem, all of this. How you like your mom? When we start talking about my mom. The truth about my mom is that my mom did a lot of work in Al-Anon over the years, and I love Al-Anon. If there are any Al-Anons here tonight, I'm very grateful for the work that you guys did to help my mom. You changed her radically. She did some therapy, and, uh, and, uh, and, and she got help, and she changed it. The truth is, is my mom suffered from panic di- disorders. Uh, my mom uh, uh, had horrible mood swings. My mom really struggled with her emotions. She's she's like, I mean, she, she's sick like me. How are they sick like you? Not sick like, well, that person's sick and an SOB, but like me, sick. I'm sick with alcoholism. She's sick with her own stuff. And I don't like her symptoms, right, and what she did. Oh, it disturbed me. How it made me feel. But they, like ourselves, are sick too. I got alcoholism. I am not a bad guy trying to get good. I'm a sick guy trying to get well. Isn't that what they told me when I was new? And if I'm a sick guy driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, and self-pity, under the lash of alcoholism, I did some things for which I feel bad that I am not necessarily guilty for because I was driven by my disease. Now, don't mishear me. I'm responsible for all of them. 
and we have a responsibility step where I will clean up the mess. But I believe that the universe gives me a little bit of credit, not the people I hurt, but the universe, the spirit, God, gives me a little bit of credit. You know, you're a sick guy getting away. There's a price to pay for that. You have to be willing to give that. I had to be willing to look at my mom and say, you know, my mom was sick like me. My mom, my mom, the truth is I would catch her crying sometimes about the guilt she felt of the way she treated us kids. The truth is the look on her face sometimes, it was clear that she was out of control and she knew it and she felt bad for the way that our home was. You could tell that. And then years later, I've had many conversations with her where I know that's true. Can I see how I might have treated people badly under the lash of a disease that made me react badly in social circumstances? Am I like her? Yeah. Putting out of our minds the wrongs others have done. Now, that doesn't mean that others aren't wrong. Others are wrong. And he's put it out of your mind. We're not going to talk about it. So we're not going to talk about my part or your part. The problem with my part is if this is the whole thing, which one's the part? Right? Alcoholics will say that they are sometimes at fault as long as they're sure others are more to blame. And we do that in AA by saying, well, it's my part. You have the big bit. I have the part. Let's just look at my part. We don't do that in AA. In AA, what we do is we put out of our minds the wrongs others have done. done. What did I do? What kind of a son was I to a woman that was struggling to raise two boys all by herself? What kind of a son was I to a woman that had been left by her husband? What kind of a what kind of compassion? Now, I wasn't capable of the compassion. But wouldn't it have been nice if I was? Wouldn't that have been a better way to behave? I don't let my mom off the hook right away, and we don't become close friends right away. But a crack in the wall starts to happen, and I start to imagine for the first time. I love that line where it says, referring to our list, we, 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 would say it says, uh, we were prepared to look at things from an entirely different angle. I'd never looked at it from their angle. What was it like to be them? I'd only ever looked at it from my angle. What was it like to be me? Because after all, I am the center of my universe, self-centered to the core. I've only ever considered what it's like to be me, never what it's like to be them. And I start to see that my mom is this three-dimensional person with her own fears, her own resentments, her own, her own stuff. And I start to let her off the hook. And then he says, what about your dad? Oh, let's talk about your dad. What do you think it was like for your dad? He says, do you think that your mom got all those things happened to her with her emotions when he left? Or is it possible that she was like that before? I, said, I don't know. You don't know. You've bet your whole life on the fact that you know this one, so be careful. Is it possible that maybe, perhaps, maybe she was like that before? I guess. Is it possible that in 1960, 1962, when they got married, 63, when they got married, in that small Jewish community, in that small town in the north of England, while conscription was still going on and your dad had to go in the military quickly, do you think it's possible they got married before he really knew? I suppose. Is it possible that he came home from the military and he discovered that he'd married a woman whose emotions he couldn't handle? And he would have left. But she got pregnant with your older brother. Is it possible? It's possible. Is it possible that when your brother was two years old, and getting out of diapers, that he would have left then and just sent money to help take care of the bills, but she got pregnant with you? Is it possible that he stayed as long as he could? And when he left, the reason that he didn't stay in that small town in the north of England is because to do that and defend his honor, he would have had to talk about her problems. So instead, he moved 200 miles away, then 3,000 miles away, and then ended up in Southern California, 6,000 miles away. Is it possible that he did the very best he could? Is it possible? I guess. Maybe. What would you have done, Sheldon, if you were your dad? When I was 16 years old, I wiped dirt over my face, and I went down to the local government, and I told them my mom would kick me out, and I'd been sleeping on a golf course. And I signed on a welfare in my own right, because I had to get out of that house. I couldn't stand to live there no more. I had to get out of that house. What would I have done? I'd have come home from the Army or the Air Force, actually. And my mom would have said I'm pregnant. And I would have said, good luck with that. And out of school. Because I'm a runner. That's what I've done all my life. Look at my history. It gets hard. I run. That's what I do. What do you think I would have done? Out of school. And I don't let my dad off the hook right away. I don't immediately forgive him. We don't 
walk off in the sunset. But a little crack in the wall starts to appear. And he and I start to form a relationship. Fear is the chief activator of all my character defects. Fear is really what's going on. How do I know that? Bracket alongside every name on the list is fear. Well, I didn't do that on my list, but that's what it says of Mr. Brown, the employer, Mrs. Brown, and the wife, right? Why? Well, because what's affected? Self-esteem. What does that mean? I'm afraid of what you think of me, and I'm afraid it'll be true. Pocketbook. I'm afraid that you're affecting my money. Whether you really are or not, I'm on the muscle about it. Personal relationships. I'm afraid that you're making me look bad in the light of my friends, including sex. I'm afraid you're going to get in the way of my sex life. I'm afraid of my ambition will stop me getting what I want. Pride, you'll make me look bad. I'm just afraid. I'm not angry at all. I'm just afraid. My sexual conduct, why do I look at that? You want to get me afraid or angry? Boy, you know, those guys and girls that sponsor guys and girls, 3 o'clock in the morning when the phone rings, it's very rarely about the boss. It's usually about, you'll never believe what he did this time. You'll never believe what she did this time. So we write the list and we share the list. Write the list and we share the list. Six and seven, nobody understands. Don't worry about six and seven. <laughs> six and seven is the story of my sobriety. It is the journey. But it's not a journey that I took at my first run through the steps of 30 days sober. It's a story of my sobriety for which I can give a two-hour long talk on and I'm already out of time. Six and seven is the journey. It is... If in step three, all I do is make a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. So in other words, the old joke, the old timers used to tell, if there's two frogs on a log and one makes a decision to jump off, how many frogs are on the log? And I want to say one, and they go, no, 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 two, because it was only a decision. If the frog took step six, there'd be a splash. Because <laughs> in step six, I start to act like a guy that believed God exists. I start to put the scientific method in place. Eight and nine. Clean up the mess. Not their mess, your mess. Get right with God. I'll tell you a funny story. I'm going to be very quick here. I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to be very quick here. A friend of mine uh, who I grew up with, a guy that I drank with and a guy that I got sober with. I've known this guy for 31 years. He's my best friend in the world. He stood up for me at my wedding. I stood up for him at his wedding. He lives in California where I met him and I live in Las Vegas. He travels to Vegas sometimes, but he doesn't always tell us he's coming because if he does and he doesn't have time to visit, he doesn't want to hurt our feelings. So often we'll get a phone call, hey, I'm in town. I got some time. Can I swing by? So he calls up and he says that. And I go, sure, bud, no problem. I go, honey, guess what? Carrie's coming over. Carrie's coming to the house. And she freaks out. What, what's wrong? She says, the house is a mess. Help me clean the house. What do you mean, clean the house? Why? It's Corey. I've known this guy for 31 years. He don't give a shit if the house is a mess. I don't care. Clean the house. And she starts putting stuff away and doing the dishes. And she's freaking out, right? And I don't know what's wrong with her. I go, would you stop it? Would you, let's make the house more messy. It's Corey, for God's sakes. What is wrong with you? And she stopped me. And she she didn't yell at me or nothing. She goes, you don't get it. I know Kari doesn't care. I care. If that house is messy when Kari's here, I'm going to be sitting there the whole time and I'm going to be convinced of a lie. I'm going to be convinced that Kari thinks the house is a mess and I'm a bad housekeeper. I'm going to be convinced he's judged. I know he's not judging me, but I won't be able to stop my ego. I'm going to feel uncomfortable if the house is a mess and we have a guest. Help me clean the house so I can enjoy our friend. Whoa. <laughs> You know what? You know why we do 4 through 9? You know why we live in 10 and 11? We're getting the house ready for God. And God don't care. I got to tell you, there's nothing you can do. Nothing. Nothing on this world. This is great news for you. Nothing you can do that will make God love you any less than he does right now. Nothing you can do. Nothing you've ever done. I got some bad news. There's nothing you can do. Absolutely nothing you can do that will make God love you more. God just loves you. But you're not going to invite him into a dirty home. You're not going to have a meaningful conscious contact with a power greater than yourself if you're ashamed of what the house looks like inside. So we got a clean house. Not that God cares, but so you'll let the grace come in. God's, God will come in anyway, but you got a clean house so God, so you will let the grace in.
and you want that feeling of uselessness to slip away, boy, help somebody. Do something for somebody else. So I go on this journey through the step. I This is the goofiest thing in the world. I sponsor you. I go to my sponsor. I go, you know what, sponsor? I say, you know, I'm, 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 I'm staying sober and I'm fine and whatever. But, God, you know, I don't, I get this problem and I don't know what to do. And he would say to me, Sheldon, what would a guy do that believed in God? Not you. <laughs> Not you. But a guy that believed in spiritual principles, what would that guy do? What would a guy do that was an active everyday member of Alcoholics Anonymous for 12 Golden Steps in his life and a home group of a sponsor that was helping guys? What would that guy do? <laughs> well, then act as if. Act as if God exists. And you know, you do that for a little while and you don't necessarily believe in God, but I tell you what happens. Stuff starts to work out. It's funny. You know, I stopped yelling at my boss and telling him where to shove his job, and he started to promote me. It's amazing. I started to show up on time. I started to treat my wife with respect. She started to like me. I started to be nice to my mom. She started to call me and see how I was doing. I started to live by spiritual principles, and the world started. And I'm not telling you that I immediately started to believe in God, but my life started to make sense. So even though I don't believe in God, I'm still doing I'm going to act as if. I'm going to act as if. When we say act as if in Alcoholics Anonymous, we do not mean act as if you're fine. How are you fine? Fine. No. Tell us how you're doing. You're, you, you keep that, you got to tell, the, be transparent. But act as if, act as if when you ask for help from God, that help is already on the way. Act as if, as my sponsor says, the cavalry has already left the fort. The help is already on the way. Act as if God exists. That's what I do. I act as if God exists. And I don't know when it happened. I gotta tell you, I don't know when it happened. I couldn't even tell you if it was five years, six years, ten years. But at some point in my sobriety, I realized I wasn't acting anymore. I don't even know when it happened. It took a while for me because I'm stubborn. But at some point, I woke up in the middle of my life. And you know what? I don't just believe in God. I'm absolutely certain that he exists. I don't know his name. Don't want to know. Don't know his birthday. Not interested. Don't know his favorite song. If you do, good for you. That's beautiful. <laughs> really, keep it to you. That's top secret information. Keep it to yourself. You know, you don't want to let that kind of stuff out the bag. I'm serious. Let's keep that inside. But I know that God exists, and I know he loves me, and I know he's going to keep me sober. And I don't know when it happened. But for me, for this alcohol, the scientific method, the pragmatic approach to, to sobriety and spirituality worked. I took the experiment. And at the end of the experiment, I can look back on my life and I can tell you it's better with God than without. And I don't know how it happened. I don't know when it happened. I just know that it happened. I'm a grateful, active, everyday member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm thankful to all of you for my life. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.